Hey everyone, my name is Damian Thorkelson. I'm a student success specialist here at Cuyahoga Community College, the Western Campus. And I wanna thank you and welcome you for logging in and attending our session. I just wanted to welcome you and let you know that you are muted upon entry. But if you will, feel free to raise your hand. And if you have a question, use the chat feature on the screen and ask questions to engage with other attendees and our um, panelists. Thank you for attending this success week session. You will receive a survey at the end of the session, and we would highly encourage you to fill it out and give us some feedback on how we can improve this event for the future. And I'm going to hand it over to our panelists and let them introduce ourselves. And we'll start off with introducing Kevin Berg. Thank you, Kevin. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Berg, and I am a counselor at the Western Campus. So I'll send it over to... Greetings all, my name is David Nardecchia and I too am a counselor at the Western Campus. Um, happy that you're here and looking forward to meeting with you. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Dan Briggio. Thank you, Dave. I'm Dan Briggio. I'm a psychologist. Um, I am a counselor doing personal counseling at the Western Campus on Mondays and Fridays and I'm going to hand it over to Laura Moncrief. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Laura Moncrief. I'm one of the campus psychologists along with Dan. Uh, working at the Western Campus Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So between Dan and I, we've got you covered for personal counseling. Perfect. Kevin? Damien, yeah, Damien and Megan, I still am not able to share the PowerPoint. So as soon as I get that, we will get that up and running. Hey, look, it works. Right. There we go. Awesome. Dave, go ahead and start talking. Kevin, and can you there. share, please? Say what? Can you share the screen, please? Yeah, I'm working I can't on it. See it. There it is. <laughs> there we go. All good, and I'm just going to pop in really quick here to say that Kevin and Dave are the only ones that will be unmuted for the time being. But if anyone has anything else to say, we can unmute you at any time and you can unmute yourself. Throughout this presentation, if anybody ever has any questions uh, or wants to just make a comment. Presentation, please use the chat box down uh, on your screen right now. We'll answer any and all questions that we can. And if we can't, uh, we have uh, both Dr. Moncrief and Dr. Briggio that will be able to help us with that as well. Uh, but we think we should be able to take care of everybody. So, Dave, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, and I will be your screen man. Okay. Well, again, everyone, thanks for being here and greetings. I am David Nardecchia, and we're going to talk a little bit today about suicide awareness, as well as some data associated with that. And Kevin, um, what we're going to also do is look at today's agenda. But before we do that, we wanna thank you so very much for being here. This means a significant amount to us and we really appreciate that you want to make a difference, not perhaps only in your own life, but in the lives of others. So thank you. So what we want to look at is some of our local and national overview of data today. I think that what we will find is that some of these numbers are very, very um, eye opening and sobering. We also want to look at some of the signs and symptoms of mental illness. And we also want to look at some suicide risk factors and warning signs. We'll also take some time to look at what to say and what not to say. And then we also are going to learn about some of the referral services that we offer, uh, including our campus and psychological services that are offered at each campus. We're going to talk a lot about our Help Us Here website as well. And we're going to also make references to local and national resources. Kev? There we go. All right. So today's goals, as we are going to see, is to increase our awareness about many of the warning signs and risk factors of suicide. One of the things that we'll find out later is that nearly 70 percent of individuals who die by suicide tell someone prior to their act. 
We're going to also look at the potentialities of stress and depression as being primary causes for suicide. And then we're going to also look at something about the vocabulary surrounding suicide. One of the other goals that we hope to do is change the stigma that is associated not only with mental illness, but also suicidal thinking. It's important for us to recognize that suicide is a health issue that can be prevented. And I know that a lot of us have probably heard this before, but it is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. The reality is, is that every obstacle that an individual faces does have a back door as a means to be able to get out of. Kev? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Kevin, you want to do the stats? Uh, I can do that. So one of the the most important things that that we need to begin to dis, uh, to talk about is really under uh, suicide um, uh, and how it can help. So if you look at current statistics, um, they're talking about an estimated 26% of Americans uh, 18 and older live with a diagnosable mental health disorder. Now. One of the things, and I've got colleagues here that, that I'd love to chime in on this one. These are talking about the mental health aspect of things. Uh, when we start talking about suicidality, we have a tendency to automatically go to, well, that person must have a mental health disorder. Uh, suicidal ideation, unfortunately, in my humble opinion, uh, and I'll lean on my colleagues here to chime in, uh, is a lot more common, uh, at least the, the idea and the thought behind it. Now, what we have though, and what we wanna do is we wanna support each other and, and understand and, and discuss how we can help each other when we're struggling, whether it's with stress, whether it's with anxiety. Um, the worst thing in the world that we can do is suffer in silence. Uh, and that's one of the things, the reason Dave and I do these presentations and the reason we have Dr. Moncrief and Dr. Briggio with us is so that we stop doing that um, because we don't want our statistics to increase. And unfortunately, right now, what we're seeing with suicide uh, rates is that they are increasing. Um, especially in that 18 to 24 year range, uh, that's the onset of a lot of mental illnesses, uh, whether we're talking uh, schizophrenia, anxiety, many of those types of things. Um, and when we talk about the college age population, who are we talking about? Not all, uh, but predominantly you're talking in that 18 to 24. Uh, they also are the least likely to, to ask for help. Um, Dave and I have talked many times about the invincibility. Uh, a lot of times at that age, people believe, oh, I can do anything. I can, nothing can harm me. And, and no, <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, and I'm a firm believer. And one thing I tell every student I work with is nobody graduates college by themselves that we all, if, if you look up in the, uh, on the screen and you see uh, Dr. Moncrief, Dr. Briggio, Dave, myself, we all had assistance throughout the, the, our entire college education. Whether well, it was a mentor or someone there to support us and pick us up when we were down. Um, what we wanna do is make sure everybody in that 18 to 24 and really everybody at Tri-C understands there's some great resources and, and we're here to help you. We would love to eliminate the, the fact that suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst college age students. Um, so Dave, go ahead. Kevin, so can, can I pop in for a minute? Ab absolutely. Yes. Um, one of the things that I've been noticing over the years of working, especially at Tri-C and when I've worked at other universities, is a lot of people are afraid to say that they have those suicidal ideations. The ideations don't mean that you're going to follow through with them. They just mean that you're going, you're, that you, you've had the thought and they're afraid to say anything because they're afraid that somebody like myself or, or Dr. Briggio, Kevin, Dave, if, that we're gonna pink slip them and send them off to the hospital as soon as they say, I, I'm thinking about suicide or it would be nice to be dead or whatever. Right. Yeah. That's not the case, but if there's a serious concern, of course we will, but it's not going to be just automatic. Yeah. I think people are very afraid of that and that's why they don't say anything. 
Well, the reality is, and to take that a little further, is that some would consider it abnormal to not consider what death by one's own hand would be like. So, you know, it's not abnormal for a person to periodically have those thoughts. Yeah. It's when those thoughts become the more predominant thoughts, and then the actions behind those thoughts typically will accompany those. And so I agree 100% with what Drs. Berg and Moncrief indicated. And I think Dan looks like he wants to pop in there as well. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add one thing about, um, you know, the, the uh, number 25% of the population having a diagnosed mental illness. And that's usually considered what we call a point in time. Um, but over the course of a lifetime, almost all of us will experience trauma, uh, anxiety, depression at some point that could be diagnosed as a mental illness. So uh, it's really much more common even than 25% of the population. Excellent point. Excellent point. Well stated. So we wanted to throw up here some uh, Ohio suicide rates as well. Um, not going to read the screen to everybody, but we're just wanting to try to paint the picture for what we're talking about here today. Uh, 11th leading cause of death in Ohio, but when you start breaking it down by age range population, uh, you start, it, the numbers become more frightening. Um, what we're also seeing, at least within the last five to ten years is suicide rates are climbing particularly amongst females um, and, and there are some correlations we're not there yet to be able to say there's definitive uh, relaying to social media uh, and its impact and, and individuals struggling um, both with the, the fear of being left behind, but also with uh, anxiety in regards to that. So again, just some, some general stats uh, leading to suicidality. Um, Dave, my screen is completely blocked with other windows. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to you and then I'll come back a little bit later. Okay, so as we saw from Dr. Berg, um, the statewide numbers that approximately every five hours, someone in Ohio dies by suicide. To kind of bring that a little closer to home, as it were, um, the Adams Board recently stated in a television news interview that in Cuyahoga County in 2018, which is the most uh, current data that is available, uh, Cuyahoga County had the highest numbers of death by suicide since 1985. That is a very significant thing. And in addition to what Dr. Berg had conveyed to us with respect to social media. Uh, one of the things that I also um, like to kind of accompany that with is that there's also a huge increase in levels of what we call hopelessness. Okay, that is something that we're kind of seeing across the board, irrespective of one's age. And when one considers the fluidity of the world that we are currently living in, and the stressors associated when we kind of come down that funnel a little bit um, to the stressors associated in our own area, we can see how hopelessness can definitely be identified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I always like to chime in here because Dave and I have, have mm -hmm. many conversations about um, uh, think about right now, we, we know what's going on with COVID-19, all of us anxious and suffering under that one uh, current racial tensions in the United States with the death of George Floyd. But a lot of people, uh, it seems like it's on the back burner about opioids and their presence right now still in Northeast Ohio as well. Uh, that, that's a lot going on in the world at the same time. So yeah. that's why we're always here saying, hey, if you need help, come find us. It's uh, also kind of a commentary when respective police departments or other agencies put out warnings to say that there is a bad batch of heroin going around. Be careful. Okay. No, I, I struggle when it, anybody that's driven into downtown Cleveland lately, there are actually billboards talking about fentanyl. Um, I believe it's in water or on pretzels trying to get in and talking about if fentanyl was mixed with your cocaine. That's where we are right now. So we, we want to make sure and knowledge is a huge piece of this, which is why we do these trainings. Um, 
and we want to just make sure that we're, we're spreading that and giving people good information. So Dave, we'll turn it back over to you. Sorry. Okay. Kevin, um, okay, thank you. So as we can look at some of the suicide statistics nationwide, we see that, uh, again, in 2017, which was the, the most recent year um, available for suicide statistics there. Thanks, Kevin. Um, 40, a little bit more than 47,000 Americans died by suicide. And there were approximately 1.4 million attempts. Now, here's what's really fascinating about that particular number is that in the year 2014, which was the year prior when data had been compiled, it was 1.3, okay? So if we stop and look at the increased number of attempts, it's actually very interesting. So on average, there are an av uh, 129 deaths by suicide per day in our country. Again, that number is an increase from 2014. Males are three and a half times more uh, likely to die by suicide than females. And white males, as you can see, accounted for approximately 70%. You can also see in the graphic on the screen is that the the huge, the largest way or modality that people choose to take their own lives is by firearm. Um, unfortunately, in a lot of instances, the um, the after effects of what the decedent leaves behind and the, the ongoing trauma. And I think that Laura and Dan can definitely echo in on this uh, with an individual who dies by suicide, irrespective of modality, can the, the length of the trauma that can um, impact that person. Okay, next. So this is an area that is of particular interest to me. And Kevin, if you click it again, the number of veterans in our country who die by suicide per day is 22. The reason that I have this particular graphic of freedom not being free speaks a whole lot more in-depthly than the freedoms that we enjoy. Many of our soldiers going back to World War II have had to endure some very, very traumatic and significant life-changing experiences. When we add conflicts, later conflicts, Vietnam, the Gulf War, and other conflicts associated with that, we have to understand that many people um, have become traumatized by post-traumatic stress disorder and many times also a lot of our military personnel have very resolute ways of attempting to deal with some of the ongoing trauma. And this is the sociologist in me, and I apologize for it, um, but this is something I've talked to Dr. Moncrief about, and that is trauma isn't just for our soldiers. We know they're there. We, we know they have high PTSD uh, rates. Um, however, that also includes individuals who are victimized, uh, sexual victimization. Um, I even would argue uh, extreme poverty. Uh, the rates of PTSD in, in, in sexual assault victims is actually higher than soldiers. I am not discounting what our soldiers do, and we absolutely have to do that. But please don't think that if I know someone who's struggling and, and it's not as bad as someone else, that's not a game we want to play. Get people help. That's what we really want to stress. It's not trauma comparison. No, not at all. Okay. It's important to understand that when we talk about community colleges, especially in the state of Ohio, many of which are non residential. <clears throat> there is a huge uptick in the at-risk populations, and as we can see, as we saw by the data that was presented previously, males are at an increased risk, as are international students, those who are in the LGBTQ and questioning uh, community, as well as students that have pre-existing mental health disorders. Again, as we had stated, uh, returning military and veterans, and as Kevin so wonderfully indicated, those who are struggling with poverty, you know, something that that we take very seriously at Tri-C 
is trying to ensure that the needs of our students universally <clears throat> are being met, met. Some of our students are food challenged. Some of our students are shelter challenged, but that does not prevent them from going to, to college. And so we take that very um, significantly to them <clears throat> and we understand that. So one of the things that we try to do is address the universal needs of our population. But it's also important to remember that the struggles that they have to contend with on the outside are very significant as well. And of course, during the pandemic, many have been laid off and not rehired, which is adding to the problem. Absolutely. Excellent point. Uh, Dave, you're on a roll. You want to keep going? Sure, Kev. <laughs> I mean, Dr. Moncrief, you can definitely jump in on this one, asking Dan. Um, we have to understand that suicide is not always one sole event or one sole factor. We have to understand that there are multiple things that can contribute to an individual's death by suicide, including on the list that you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, a history of suicidal behaviors, life stressors. And as Dr. Briggio so wonderfully pointed out, you know, in light of the COVID thing and the crash of the incomes and therefore the livelihoods of so many families, um, that is amazingly stressful. We also have to all, uh, recognize that there have been rec um, notable increases in substance use and abuse since the epidemic has occurred. And uh, there is a lot of increased alcoholism um, as well as illicit drug use, hence the increases recently in overdose. The good news is we talked about uh, previously is that most people tell us uh, prior to dying by suicide, 90% of individuals will demonstrate clear warning signs and 80% actually and overtly tell someone. As we had stated at the outset, nearly 70% of students tell a friend that they are feeling suicidal before telling anyone else. The thing that's important for us to recognize is this. Students are nearly 20, a quarter more likely or 20% more likely to receive treatment on campuses that are perceived to be supportive of mental health issues than not. So the reality is, is that in our language, if, if we stigmatize those who struggle with mental wellness, um, obviously those who feel that there is a stigma there are not going to want to seek treatment versus offering a supportive environment to say, hey, if you feel a need to want to chat, we're here for you and feel free to do that. Dan, Laura? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's what the Counseling Center and Dan and I especially are there for is we are, Dan and I are strictly there to provide that personal counseling and to um, make sure that people are aware that they, you know, that we're here and we're, we're even during the pandemic, we're, we're available. Yes, and of course, we're primarily doing phone counseling, and I think it's been a little bit more difficult for referrals to make their way to us. Um, but again, we are still there and we have availability, so please contact us. And I agree with both uh, doctors, my and crew from Bridgio as well. It, it, doing teletherapy does bring with it its own sets of challenges. However, that does not mean that we are not accessible. So when we look at a strength-based approach that we try to utilize when referencing the language and the terminology of Tri-C, it's important for us to recognize that instead of criticizing other people, we should probably focus a lot on the things that they bring to the table, their strengths, the things that they have as gifts. Um, we will also want to understand that language and thoughts influence perceptions. In our current society and some of the struggles that our country is currently enduring, this is a very, very significant thing for us to consider. Again, 
perceptions can clearly lead to actions as well. We also have to speak in healthy language. As you heard us reference several times earlier, historically and forever before this, a person committed suicide. And that has such an attached legality to it. Um, however, the new phraseology that is being emphasized is that an individual has died by suicide, okay? We try to look at mental health struggles as a challenge, not a problem. Many people who struggle, for instance, on the autism spectrum are actually very brilliant individuals and they're very gifted in so many areas of their lives. Those who may have a diagnosable thing such as Tourette's syndrome or something along those lines also can be extraordinarily brilliant individuals but have neurological tics that they cannot control. We like to focus on wellness, not what a person's limitations are. And we feel that that is very important. It's important for us to look at a starting point in how we can build from there. Okay, these are the things that are in that person's basket. How can we look at each of those things individually and build upon them from there? If that means seeking behavior, or seeking help uh, from other people, be it friends, be it family, be it an outside resource, that's obviously something that we really, really encourage. And as we've been in emphasizing today, the need to promote counseling. You know, the reality, as Dr. Briggio had stated to us earlier, is that every one of us throughout different areas or phases of our lives are going to struggle with different challenges, be it trauma, be it grief, be it dealing with the loss of a loved one, be it a change in family status. There are so many things that can happen at different points in an individual's life. The other thing that we also really like to emphasize is the importance of open communication. You know, I can speak for Dr. Berg as well as myself. One of the things that we always tell our students is that if you need anything, you make sure you get in touch with us and we're gonna do what we can do to help you or refer you to a place that can help you. It's important to have, uh, again, a crisis plan in place, and that is one of the things that at Tri-C has done an extraordinary job at doing, and that is at the Western campus specifically, we have a great crisis response team. Um, you're looking at four of those individuals right now, um, and we do an awful lot to work with different departments on campus, so if something should transpire, a lot of the departments know what to do and who to call. That was beautifully stated, Dave. I just want to add to that. When we talk wellness, um, this and again, this is the social worker in me. I want to have a lot of people around me that are there to be supportive and to, to help me move forward and go along. Uh, any student that I'm working with, I, I tell every student that I work with, we're going to build from your strengths we're not going to ignore your your weaknesses, but we're going to build from those strengths. What's very interesting, though, is how many people sometimes they can identify every weakness they've got. But when you ask them what their strength is, they struggle with that more. Trust us, everybody has strengths. Uh, I have a huge issue with uh, attention span at particular moments in time. But really? I have now leave me alone. All right, <laughs> but I've turned that into a strength because now I, I'm, I'm the master of multitasking. So make sure you build people around you. I am not an expert uh, on dealing with schizophrenia or, or with certain aspects of anxiety. But I know who to get them to, and that's what that's I think the essence of all of this is is don't suffer in silence. There are a lot of people out there, even though at times it feels like there's not. Trust me, there's a lot of people out there that are going to be willing to provide assistance and to help you uh, get the help that you need. And the biggest thing is to ask for the help. Absolutely. We can't read everybody's minds and we don't know what's going on with you internally. So if we don't ask, we don't know. So I'm going to also, again, the sociologist, yeah, the sociologist in me is coming back of um, half the population, uh, unfortunately, is, is feeling like they're being trained not to express emotion. Uh, the male population is allowed to show anger and they're allowed to, to show happiness. 
but there's a, a broad range of emotions. Um, and it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to lean on other individuals. I'm talking to Dave and, and Laura all the time because I, I need help and support with certain students. Those are apps. So uh, just my ploy out there to, sorry, I always got to bring the sociology back into it, don't I? Well, no, Kevin's <laughs> actually right. Um, you know, when we talk about gender role stereotypes, you know, again, males are not only taught to be angry uh, and humorous, they're also taught to be aggressive. They're also taught historically to minimize any physical pain. Um, <clears throat> there are probably not any participants in here <clears throat> me, who are old enough to remember the old phrase, no pain, no gain. Um, we can say without reservation that I emulate that on a daily basis. Um, but we won't elaborate. <laughs> when we ask you, in of all of the individuals that you see here in these photos, if we were to ask individuals to participate in the chat room, of the following, who has attempted suicide? Unfortunately, the answer is not only did every individual in this um, screen attempt suicide, they all died by suicide. But if we stop and look at just based on appearance, the cross section, we can see that suicide does not discriminate male, female, skin color, um, status in the society that we live in, be it an armed services personnel, be it an individual from the South, be it male, female, again, we can see that suicide definitely does not discriminate. Okay. And then Kev, you can take the warning signs. Okay, so one of the, the most common questions that we get a lot is, how do, what do I do if a friend, or what do I do, what do I say? Uh, when I've done this in classes before, and I say if, if somebody comes up to you and, and says they're struggling uh, and, and contemplating suicide, the most common answer given is nothing. I don't know what to say. I didn't see the warning signs. Well, let's talk about those. What are warning signs? Um, listen to the language that individuals are using. Uh, they're feeling that they're a burden, that they're trapped, that there's, there's no way out. Um, I have had students walk into my office saying, I think the world would actually be better if I wasn't here. Those are red flags and those are immediate, well, let's talk about this and let's see what's going on. Uh, I am a firm believer that the single greatest thing to watch for is an individual's behavior. Uh, are we seeing changes in behavior, uh, increased drug use, uh, too much or not enough sleeping? Um, have they changed who they are? Are they more aggressive? I mean, all of these can be warning signs uh, of something underlying going on. It may be suicidality. It might be something else, but it gives us reason to pause and it gives us a reason to ask questions. The most powerful thing that I, I work with people on is, is to recognize we have one mouth and two ears for a reason. Uh, and that's because we need to be listening a lot more than we're actually talking. Um, a lot of times people are telling us things and we immediately turn into that change agent of, well, I'm going to help them. Uh, well, maybe, but you're not there to solve the problems for them. Get them to professionals and let us see how we can help. And the other aspect for warning signs to look out for is an individual's mood. Um, do you have a friend that you used to spend every day with and then all of a sudden they've lost an interest in everything? Uh, increased irritability, uh, rage, um, anxiety. There's a number of warning factors out here. Um, again, having one of these doesn't mean, oh my God, I'm so worried about so-and-so. But maybe what that means is maybe let's have a conversation. Uh, and, and with those warning signs, there are different levels and different tiers that we can be talking about. An individual coming up, and, and like Dr. Moncrief said, just if somebody who's frustrated and says, I think I'm just going to kill myself, is drastically different than an individual that has begun giving their stuff away, has retreated from everything, 
has an active plan, those are two different individuals. One of those, uh, the individual who has the active plan, we might need to talk about getting them help immediately. The other, are you frustrated or are we talking about something else? Uh, but that's what the professionals will help figure out. What we need help with is we need help from friends, family, everybody saying, hey, I've got someone, could you just talk to them? And for all the students out there, we absolutely are, are willing to talk to anybody. And if not us, give them different lifelines, give them uh, hotlines, give them text chat lines, uh, give them all of those things to, so that, that way they can have something between them and possibly making a, a horrible decision. Um, so when we're talking about, only thing I hate about WebEx meetings is all the windows. Uh, where do we start becoming more and more concerned? If we have an individual who simply says something to us, we, yes, all of us are going to be concerned, but it's when we start layering on more and more of these warning signs. Uh, Dave brought up hopelessness. Uh, there is nothing harder for me to witness in the world than talking to a young man or a young woman that walks into my office and they've lost all hope. And, and you can see it in their body language as well as what they say. Um, feeling trapped, a burden to others. Um, all of these layered on top of each other uh, means that we need to, to intervene and, and potentially get some individuals some help. And Dave, I think you did a nice job with the slides talking about, and if you want to talk about the red, yellow flag, red flag, go for it. There, Dave. Oh, thank was you. Muted. <laughs> was muted. Yes. Can you back up for one moment, please, Kevin? I don't I know if I can or not, Dave. I will try. Uh, oh, you know what? Never mind. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> nope, I got um, it. Looky there. Look at you. <laughs> So the one, the one uh, statement in this particular slide that I would really like to emphasize is showing rage or talking about seeking revenge. One of the things that Freud famously stated is that suicide is murder turned around 180 degrees. There is actually a form of suicide that is called I will show them. And it's essentially, I'm cut. If you've heard the phrase, I'm going to cut my own nose off just to spite my face. In other words, I'm going to take my own life just to show you how serious I was about this. The problem is, is that, that that person does not have the opportunity to reconcile that deep psychic pain that they might be experiencing. And then, of course, obviously, there is the trauma of the individual that had to. Um, be identified, for lack of a better description, as the reason for an individual's uh, cessation by suicide. So, all right. So now what we want to do is we want to look at some yellow flags and red flags. So we call these tier two or level two warning signs. So in the classroom, you or a friend um, can look for some of the following symptoms or signs. In the classroom, again, if that person who had been coming to class regularly just kind of drops off the map, or if you notice that they started the class right at the top tier of a 4.0 and then out of nowhere, um, their grade point just completely dumped. They seem that they're having difficulty with focus. They might sleep in class. There's a lot of different um, signs, as Kevin stated earlier, that an individual will give off. And we look at, again, the emotional changes, um, changes in mood, lethargy, listlessness. A once usually optimistic person might become pessimistic. Um, they might start increasing the phase of, what's the use or I just wish this was all over. I just don't really want to make a, you know, wake up anymore, those kinds of things. So we look at, um, again, those who are also known to have struggled with trauma of some type, be it sexual assault, relationship violence, a legal issue. It could even be a traffic accident. It could be COVID-19. And there are a lot of different things. It could be medical trauma as well. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have a very good friend who has just been a recipient of a double lung transplant. And while she's doing very well, she's embracing every moment of it and still trying to grasp and wrap her brain around the reality that she could go outside of her house and not have to tug an oxygen tank with her. So that's obviously a huge adjustment change because we have to remember stress can be positive as well. So we also look at changes in the person's um, affiliation. So if they begin to withdraw, if they again exhibit a change in their habits, they isolate uh, from family, from friends. Now, some people do isolate as a means to recharge their batteries. Okay, there are those who might be introverted by nature, but live in the world of an extrovert. <laughs> they may need to, I don't know, do things like go to their garden or something <laughs> along those lines to kind of help regenerate and recharge. But sometimes it's when that person, for instance, has that <clears throat> inability to regenerate or to recharge that some concerns can occur. Okay. And next is when we have our red flag um, or level one warning signs. If someone overtly states that they intend to harm themselves or if they are threatened to harm themselves and that they have the means to do that, um, that is something that we need to take very, very seriously. When an individual attempts to accumulate or look for ways to harm themselves as well, that would be, again, the accumulation of pills. And just for the record, um, one of the most painful ways to die is through certain types of overdose of over-the-counter medications. Uh, a good example of that um, is aspirin, okay? Because what aspirin will do over several days is it will actually eat a hole in your stomach and therefore slowly uh, kill off the organs surrounding your stomach. And that's not intended to sound gross or um, anything like that. That's just a reality, again, that's associated with that modality. Um, someone who's talking or writing about death, dying, or suicide, um, we have been very blessed to have an English department at Tri-C who actually takes some significant time to read into many of the, the writings of our students and come right out and ask our students if there is a reason to feel concerned. And they will walk them down to our office if they are exhibiting any types of these um, signs or symptoms. And I, there's one additional one that I'm noticing, and I don't know, I might be the only one, but I have had numerous students walking into my office um, in unhealthy relationships and refusing to get out of the unhealthy relationship because their significant other is threatening to commit suicide if they ever break up with them. Mm -hmm. um, that to me waffles between a tier one and a tier two. Because yeah. if we've got an individual that's saying that and says, well, I have a gun and I've got this, we need to get the police involved or we need to because these are serious threats and I'm hoping we need to get that kind of verbiage and that kind of language out uh, that does not belong in the relationship. Uh, that's a form of manipulation and, and just needs to go away. I don't know if I'm the only one seeing it, but I, I've I've had it a lot over the last couple of semesters and no, I, I'm right there with you, Kevin. I, say, I, I don't like it. <laughs> no, not at all. I just want to add too that. In, in the age of uh, virtual classrooms now, it's a lot harder to pick up on a lot of these signs. And so we have to be sensitive to things like people dropping out uh, of communication with folks or people sending different types of messages on social media than they've ever sent before. Yeah, that's a, good point. that's a great point. Dave, you want to go ahead? Okay. <laughs> You know, it's okay to ask someone if they're having thoughts of wanting to take their own life. Um, having worked in crisis intervention in the community sector for a large number of years, one of the things that we grow adept at doing is, quite frankly, asking a person if they are 
thinking about taking their own lives. And we also emphasize that it's okay to talk about. Um, most people who feel suicidal actually are dying on the inside, excuse the pun, to want to talk about it. They feel that they're almost like a pressure cooker trying to get this out of them. And when they have finally had the opportunity to do that, it's almost as if such a sense of relief has occurred. You can almost sense a, a degree of catharsis in the individual who's had the opportunity to talk about what they're feeling, but have kept them bottled up for so long that it has been almost handicapping to them. The reality also is we cannot make a person suicidal if we talk about it. Um, if they're already thinking about it, they're going to more than likely, <clears throat> excuse me, feel a sense of relief that it's actually out in the open. Because if it's out on the table, then they're going to hopefully, again, feel a, a more significant degree of comfort with being able to share some of the things that we um are going to hear. So when we talk about active listening, that is a very, very important thing. And I know that Dan and Laura are really good when it comes to active listening. But the one thing that I really um, feel that it's important to, to emphasize is that we see a change in them. You know, we're not judging these individuals if Again, one week might seem happy and the next week uh, it might appear that their world is falling apart. The reality is, is that we've noticed the change and we want to be able to approach them and ask if everything is okay. So while well, Dave brought up some wonderful points about active listening and things, there are things that we should not do. Um, one of the biggest ones is please, uh, if, if you've got someone and, and uh, a friend is sitting with you and, and they're making comments, uh, roundabouting ideas of suicide, and you ask them directly, are you contemplating killing yourself? And they say, yes, uh, this is not your burden to take on on top by yourself. Get help. There's lots of resources, including here at Tri-C that we can help you with. Um, contact a, a, a caring adult, get other individuals involved. Um, that burden is not yours and yours alone to take on with you. Um, don't give individuals advice. Um, I actually have had students say, oh, just tell them it'll get better. Um, no, empty reassurances sometimes may not be true and may actually be counterproductive. Um, don't try to distract. Oh, you just need to get drunk tonight and that will solve the problem. No, that, that hasn't solved the problem. All we've done is move the problem somewhere else. And by the way, now you've thrown depressants on top of it. Probably not the best idea. Um, the beautiful part is, is this information is available for you uh, and it's available to all students at Tri-C uh, through the Help Is Here app and the student resources page that we'll be talking about here in just a second. Um, when I work with individuals who are suicidal, what I tell them, I want to put as many different steps between you and even thinking about uh, attempting suicide. So I want you all to have resources such as the Cuyahoga crisis hotline, the crisis text line. A younger generation might not be comfortable calling a complete stranger, but they can text them. A and the text line does a very nice job of, of reaching out and reaching back. Um, there are hearing and speech impaired. So there are lots of resources out there to help individuals. Again, don't go at it alone uh, and give individuals resources to help them. And if it's a true emergency, if you've got somebody who's literally in front of you saying something, ca call the police, call 911, and let's try to get this individual help. Dave, go ahead. I see your. Yep, thank you. Um, Kevin, you, you hit on a really good point when we talked to, when he talked about making calls and into, um, there are metrics that show that the crisis text line has had amazingly large numbers. Um, there seems to be a steady increase with each passing year that it's in existence. And that's not indicated as a negative reflection. That's actually 
indicated that people feel very comfortable with talking, quote, unquote, talking with someone via text message. Um, what's also really cool is that right now on a federal level, we're in the process of changing and adding the 988 exchange for those individuals who are having thoughts of taking their own life by suicide. Um, what used to be 911 is going to um, also, I mean, 911 will still be in existence, obviously, but an additional 988 exchange is in the process of being ratified as we speak. So that's really cool. And that's federal, so it'll be all 50 states? Yes, sir. Very cool. And the last thing we want to do is, is we want to express to you all students out there that we have lots of resources to help you. One of them being the Help Us Here website and the Help Us Here app. Uh, this app started off with uh, several of my counseling colleagues, including the Honorable Mr. Dave Nardecchia there, uh, as a, a suicide prevention app, but it's developed and it's morphed into so much more. Uh, it's very much a wellness app. There's information of, uh, there for anxiety reduction, for hopelessness, to, if you're struggling with substance abuse. Uh, so there's lots of tremendous resources out there. Uh, the website is located right here on the screen. So if you just type in help is here on the search box at any uh, Tri-C uh, web browser, you, it should take you right there. But we also have a free app uh, that is available that will get an individual one. Oh, and I, I'm going to come back to this one, Dave. Uh, here's the Help yeah. Us Here app. Uh, you can download it for free, and then you have one touch access to all of those crisis lines, the crisis text line. All of those resources are there for you, along with some of the resources for individuals that might need them, like a development of a crisis plan. Um, th there's a multitude of resources. I use it. I have it downloaded on my phone. Um, and I use a couple of the relaxation apps, especially if I'm going into a, a rough day or a rough meeting, I, I utilize it. Um, I'm a believer we need to figure out what works for us and keep doing it. Uh, so this will introduce individuals to different areas. Uh, Kevin, on that note, there's oh. a ton of uh, apps on any of the app stores of <clears throat> doing breathing or relaxation and in we'll find something that works for you. Yeah. Yeah. On the, the student resource page alone, there are more than 30 different um, opportunities for guided imagery and relaxation. We have direct links to the videos as well as soundtracks. Do they still use that phrase? Soundtracks? Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, that, that will help walk you through that. Um, Just put it on your record player and see it go. <laughs> I think I speak for Dr. Brigio and say that we prefer eight tracks, but, we won't. <laughs> but, um, but I digress. But you can see that uh, on our student resource guide, which is listed here, uh, we have specific campus resources, okay, for each particular campus, not only for counseling and psychological resources, but also uh, TRIO. We also have student accessibility services. We have the um, uh, Title IX office, which is also very important for individuals who uh, may feel uncomfortable due to um, several verbal or physical assaults against their, their gender. Um, we have local and national resources that are available. Again, we have Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, all across the spectrum. The other thing that is important to understand too, as Kevin had stated, the Help Is Here page has really morphed out uh, to the point where it is, it's a universal kind of help all for many individuals. Um, one button if, is what we call it, or channel that we are in the process of completing and adding is uh, a button on healthy relationships. Things that uh, couples do engage in um, that help promote uh, wellness between themselves as well as just as well as friendships and um, just general relationships so and I believe that is the first time in the history of Dave and I ever presenting together that we finished completely on time and without having to go click 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 so that is awesome um, right. if 
Uh, Megan, Damien, I don't know if there were any questions for us or if anything popped up. That is impressive. Um, <laughs> I've been monitoring. This. I mean, it, I mean, Damien and I were actually texting back and forth saying this presentation is amazing. Like, I feel like I just learned so much and I love that we were able to record it so that we can play it back for students who weren't able to attend. Um, super interesting. So thank you. I have been monitoring the chat. And yeah. there has not been any questions, so that means you answered everything that anyone had questions about and didn't even know it. <laughs> okay, just to let you know on the help is here page that is shown on the presentation. That is a hyperlink just so folks know that. So if you do, because it is being recorded and the individuals want to share. That's really good. And, and, and the students that do watch this, they can see that there are real faces that are here to help and that you know, you are real people really trying to make a difference and reach out. So we thank you for doing this. This is awesome. Yeah. Thanks. I'm actually a virtual robot standing in place of Dave. Um, <laughs> you, you have so many fake joints and everything that might not be too far from the truth. I thought it was more like the bionic man. <laughs> <laughs> I got my inspiration from him this weekend. Yeah. Well, Steve and I hung out, so. <laughs> Oh my God. No, thank you guys for putting this on. This yeah, was awesome. And, and Dan and Laura, thank you guys both for, for being here and, and chiming in. That was great. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Dave and I are, are going to work hard to try to get those, uh, to increase those referrals to you guys and see what we can't do. Absolutely. We're here. here. Yep. All right. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Love you, Burger. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Dave.